Welcome to NTD News. Our top stories tonight. Former President Trump says there will not be another debate. That's as Vice President Kamala Harris says they owe it to the voters to have another one. Both candidates are campaigning in swing states. Harris is rallying in North Carolina and Trump is in Arizona. In Georgia, a state court has, has dismissed two counts against former President Trump in this sprawling indictment. What the judge says. A state of emergency in California, Malibu was hit with a brief 4.7 magnitude earthquake this morning and several fires are still burning in the state. David Lamb brings us an update. Francine has been downgraded to a post-tropical cyclone, but it continues to bring heavy rains and flooding across the south. Thousands have been left without power. This is NTD Evening News. Live from our global headquarters in New York City, here's Tiffany Meyer. Good evening. Thanks for joining us. I'm Paul Graney, standing in for Tiffany Meyer today. Former President Trump says there will not be another debate. Today he's rallying in Arizona. NTD's Washington correspondent Jack Bradley has more. It looks like there won't be another presidential debate before the election. On Thursday, former President Donald Trump rejected any future debates. He wrote on Truth Social, when a prize fighter loses a fight, the first words out of his mouth are, I want a rematch. Kamala should focus on what she should have done during the last almost four-year period. There will be no third debate. This comes after his debate with President Biden back in June and just Tuesday's debate with Harris hosted by ABC, which was watched by 67 million Americans. After that, Harris said she would agree to a second debate with Trump. Trump said he would think about it, but now we have a clear answer. And on the campaign trail, the Grand Canyon state is in the spotlight on Thursday. Trump is rallying in Tucson, working to win over undecided voters in this swing state. So because we've done two debates and because they were successful, there will be no third debate. And around the same time, just miles away, Vice President Kamala Harris's husband, Doug Emhoff, is holding a campaign event also in Tucson. Arizona has historically favored Republican presidential candidates, voting Trump in 2016 and nearly re-electing him in 2020. President Joe Biden won the state by 0.3 percent. Now, Biden is the first Democrat to win Arizona since 1996 and by a narrow margin. Before that, it had been another 50 years since a Democrat won the state. Next week, Trump will hold a town hall in Flint, Michigan, where he's likely to discuss policy proposals relating to inflation and the auto industry. Trump's against a growing push to transition from gas-powered vehicles to electric, and he says that gas-powered car bans will put thousands out of jobs. Reporting from Washington, D.C., Jack Bradley, NTD News. Kamala Harris is making her first post-debate campaign stop in North Carolina, and she's calling for another debate. Anthony Jason Blair brings us an update. With polls showing a tight race, the Harris campaign has eyes on the states that will most likely decide the presidential election. Vice President Kamala Harris is visiting North Carolina with back-to-back -back rallies on Thursday. She is first in Charlotte and then Greensboro a few hours later. I believe we owe it to the voters to have another debate. This election and what is at stake could not be more important. Harris's running mate Tim Walz is in Michigan, and the second gentleman, Douglas Emhoff, has started a two-day tour spanning Arizona, Nevada, and Florida. On Friday night, Harris will be in Wilkes-Barre, Pennsylvania, for a rally. Of the seven battleground states, Pennsylvania has the most electoral votes, with 19, and according to current poll averages by Real Clear Politics, is the closest race. There are two very different visions for our country. The campaign also released a new 30-second ad on Wednesday featuring footage from Tuesday's debate. The campaign said the ad is, quote, spotlighting her commitment to bring a sense of optimism about what we can do. Singer Taylor Swift endorsed Harris on Instagram right after the debate on Tuesday night. She also encouraged people to register to vote and included a link to vote.gov. According to General Services Administration, who runs the site, over 330,000 people clicked the link within 14 hours. 
And last week, former Republican Congresswoman Liz Cheney said that she and her father, former Vice President Dick Cheney, will be voting for Harris. Reporting in Washington, D.C., Jason Blair, NTD News. Attorney General Merrick Garland today rejected claims the DOJ has a political bias. He dismissed claims that his department has been weaponized against certain politicians, and he also defended his staff. Here he is. Through your work, you have made clear that the Justice Department will not be intimidated by these attacks. But it is dangerous and outrageous that you have to endure them. It is dangerous to target and intimidate individual employees of this department solely for doing their jobs. Garland has faced criticism over his department's handling of politically sensitive cases. Those include investigations into former President Trump, sitting President Joe Biden, and the president's son, Hunter. Trump has accused federal prosecutors of bringing politically motivated criminal cases against him. During testimony before a House committee in June, Garland told lawmakers that he will not be intimidated by the attacks on the department. The Trump campaign today released a statement in response to Garland's remarks. It said that Harris has weaponized the DOJ to target her political opponent, Donald Trump. And in Georgia, two criminal charges against Trump were dismissed from the RICO indictment filed against him and several co-defendants. The judge threw out one count of conspiring to file false documents and one count of filing false documents. He said state prosecutors didn't have the authority to bring those charges, which related to the alleged filing of false documents in federal court. The remainder of the case will move forward, though, including eight charges against Trump. His lead attorney viewed the judge's ruling as a victory, saying that his team had prevailed again. The judge also dismissed a third count against co-defendant Ray Smith. And in Trump's New York criminal case, an appeals court today refused to consider the former president's request to drop the gag order. The court wrote that no substantial constitutional question is directly involved. The judge's gag order bans Trump from publicly criticizing court staff, but he is allowed to criticize the jury and witnesses. Sentencing in that case is scheduled for November 26th. A New York City Police Commissioner, Edward Caban, has resigned. A week ago, it emerged that his phone was seized as part of a federal investigation and has touched several New York officials. Mayor Adams held a press conference earlier today. Here he is. A short time ago, I re- accepted the resignation of the NYPD Commissioner, Edward Caban. He concluded that this is the best decision at this time. I respect his decision and I wish him well. Commissioner Caban dedicated his life to making our city safer, and we saw a drop in crime for 13 of the 14 months he served as commissioner. To ensure crime keeps going down in our city today, I'm taking immediate action in appointing Tom Donlin as interim police commissioner. In a statement, Caban said, quote, the noise around recent developments has made that impossible and hindered the important work our city requires. I've therefore decided it's in the best interest of the department that I resign as commissioner. Caban had been in charge of the nation's largest police department for only 15 months. He's been with the city government for 30 years, though. Other high-ranking officials also had devices seized recently. As part of a separate investigation, Mayor Adams was subpoenaed in July... That was eight months after federal agents seized his cell phones. It's unclear if the two investigations are related. Federal authorities haven't publicly accused Mayor Adams or any official of any crimes, and Adams himself has denied any wrongdoing. Adams appointed a former FBI official as the interim commissioner. And a 4.7 magnitude earthquake shook Malibu, California this morning, and while several fires actively burn in the state, no less. The governor has declared a state of emergency. A 4.7 magnitude earthquake shook Malibu, California on Thursday morning. It's around 30 miles west of Los Angeles. The U.S. Geological Survey said it had a depth of 7 miles. There were no immediate reports of injuries or significant damage. But the quake happened as the region deals with major wildfires. Governor Gavin Newsom declared a state of emergency in several cities impacted by fire. 
it is fire season. Please take seriously evacuation orders and also thank the men and women in uniform. The bridge fire grew to over 51,000 acres since Sunday and is still 0% contained. An update said that the fire behavior moderated because of an increase in humidity and cooler temperatures. A county fire spokesperson gave an update on the town of Wrightwood. With residents evacuating, firefighters were able to focus not on life safety because that threat had already been reduced. It allowed us to focus on structure defense. Firefighters made progress to target the fire 24 hours per day. The bridge fire took homes from this community, but the fact that this community is still here and as intact as it is, is a testament to the planning put in place by the community, by the residents and by first responders. Thank you. Everybody burning out, going to the gas station, gassing their cars up, trying to get out of here before they got burnt. It was, uh, it was scary, a lot more, a lot more real than you realize. It's a tight-based community. We've only been here four and a half months, so that's what I'm looking forward to because everybody here knows each other. We're all a tight-based community. We all live each other. We're all, uh, we all pray to God up here, and so it's all in God's hand. The line fire has now burned 37,000 acres but is 18% contained. David Lamb, NTD News, California. And Francine has weakened to a post-tropical cyclone. That's after making landfall in Louisiana as a Category 2 hurricane. Caused widespread power outages, pushed storm surges into coastal areas, and raised flood concerns in the region. Anthony's Christina Corona brings us the latest. Francine Center has moved past New Orleans, unleashing heavy rainfall across Louisiana, southern Mississippi, Alabama, and leaving hundreds of thousands of customers without power. Francine made landfall as a Category 2 hurricane Wednesday evening with 100 miles per hour winds in coastal Terrebonne Parish. It has since weakened to a tropical storm depression with sustained winds of 35 miles per hour as of Thursday. By 5 p.m. Eastern Time, the storm was located over northern Mississippi and is moving north at 9 miles per hour toward Memphis. Louisiana Governor Jeff Landry gave an update on the power outages. The good news is, is that at the peak, we had over 450,000 people without power, and right now we're down to 350,000 people without power. I would remind people that for us to be able to get our utilities back online, we want, if you do not have to be on the road, roadway, we urge you to stay off of the roadway. FEMA announced that federal disaster assistance is available to the state of Louisiana to supplement response efforts due to emergency conditions. The pre-landfall emergency declaration that President Biden approved um, at the governor's request um, will allow us to continue to support those life-saving efforts and make sure that the governor has what he needs and his team needs to support the immediate response efforts. A man trapped in floodwaters from Hurricane Francine was rescued by a good Samaritan, who was also an emergency room nurse. By the time I got him out of there, the entire truck was submerged, but I was probably up to like my, my chest, my neck, at the spot where I was standing. So, but it was all there was also like a little dip, and I was it was like on the curb as well. So it was probably deeper right below, which the officer said it was probably around eight feet. A storm surge warning remains in place from Grand Isle, Louisiana to the Mississippi Alabama border, signaling the risk of life threatening coastal flooding. 14 million people are currently under flood warnings with heavy rain and possible tornadoes expected in the area through tomorrow. Christina Corona, NTD News. And the University of Idaho's students' murder trial won't take place in the town where the crime took place. The Idaho Supreme Court ruled today that Brian Koberger's trial will be moved to the county surrounding the state capital of Boise. The court says District Judge Steve Hippler of Ada County will take over the case as the most populous in the state with 10 times more residents than Lauda County, where the crime took place. Koberger's legal team requested the change of venue. They argued that he might not get a fair trial in Lauda County because the local community was prejudiced against him. The trial is scheduled for June 2025. Welcome back. Israel is continuing its counterterrorism operations in the West Bank, reporting significant findings in the region. Meanwhile, Israel has shared a Hamas document that provides an inside look at the war in the Gaza Strip. And the Jason Perry has the latest.
On Thursday, the Israel Defense Forces were seen patrolling parts of the West Bank as they continue counterterrorism operations in the area. A resident in Tulkarm shared her thoughts. It is a small camp. Why are they destroying it? It hasn't done anything to them. The only demand of the camp is to live in dignity, in honor. Why are they doing this to us, I do not know. However, Israeli forces reported killing terrorists and finding a weapons manufacturing workshop and an explosives laboratory in the area. And later that day, Israel withdrew its forces from Tulkarm and residents inspected the damage that was left behind. Meanwhile, in the Gaza Strip, Israel reported that they've defeated the Hamas brigade in Rafah in the southern Gaza Strip. Israel previously said Rafah was Hamas's final stronghold in the Gaza Strip. This comes as Israel's defense minister, Yoav Gallant, shared a Hamas document on Thursday. According to the Times of Israel, Gallant said he had a letter from a former Hamas commander that was written to the leader of Hamas, Yahya Sinwar. In the letter, the commander explained that Hamas had lost 90 to 95 percent of its rocket capability and at least 50 percent of its fighters who were either killed or wounded. Meanwhile, Israel is receiving harsh criticism after an American was shot and killed in the West Bank on Tuesday. The 26-year-old Turkish American was participating in a demonstration that turned violent when protesters allegedly began throwing rocks at Israeli forces. Upon investigation, Israeli troops said they most likely unintentionally shot her when they tried to shoot the instigator of the riot. On the other hand, Turkey has opened its own investigation into the incident and will request international arrest warrants for the shooting. Israel is also facing accusations of killing six United Nations workers in an airstrike on Wednesday. Israel later released a list of nine names of terrorists who were killed in the strike, three of whom they said worked for the United Nations Relief and Works Agency, or UNRWA. Israel said they requested the names of the U.N. staffers who were killed in the strike, but said the agency has not yet responded with those details. We reached out to UNRWA for comment, and the director of communications, Juliette Tauma, said Israel has not officially requested a list of those names. She also said that Israel did not previously flag the names of any of the people it said were killed in the strike. Jason Perry, NTD News. And Poland is joining calls to allow Ukraine to fire Western missiles deep into Russia. This is Secretary of State Antony Blinken met with senior Polish leaders today. They also discussed Russia's hybrid warfare strategy, how the two NATO allies can strengthen their security ties. Italy's international correspondent Malcolm Hudson has more from us from London. Secretary of State Antony Blinken wrapped up his three-nation Ukraine-focused European tour in Poland. The security of Poland's eastern flank also featured in talks as the two nations seek to deepen their defense cooperation. Here's Blinken in Warsaw. Poland is, spent, is spending over 4% of GDP on defense. This is really the gold standard among NATO countries. And uh, we saw uh, at the NATO summit just a few months ago the extraordinary progress the alliance has made in countries stepping up and dedicating the necessary resources to defense. He said Poland is leading the way on defense spending within NATO nations. Poland has sought to strengthen the borders it shares with Belarus and Russia. Polish Foreign Minister Radosław Sikorski said Polish airspace is regularly breached by Russian drones and missiles. Last year, a Russian cruise missile traveled through two-thirds of Poland and landed 10 kilometers from my house. Sooner or later, people will be hurt. He also pointed to hybrid warfare. Migrants who, that have been on purpose uh, brought to Russia are then pushed uh, across the EU border. Um, and um, uh, one of our soldiers was actually killed defending the border of NATO, EU and the Schengen zone. He added that if another Polish citizen is hurt, Poland will take countermeasures that Russia will notice. Blinken said hybrid attacks are a deliberate strategy Russia engages in. Underscoring further collaboration with the US, Blinken said Poland is making important strides in increasing its energy security. We see this in the context of extraordinary strides across Europe, moving away from dependence on Russian energy and developing uh, different sources and self-sufficiency. He said they discussed ways the US can help Poland here which could include the first Polish nuclear power plants. 
Poland has added its voice to calls to allow Ukraine to fire Western missiles deep into Russian territory. Moscow has warned that doing so would deepen what it's called the direct involvement of the U.S. and Europe in the war and would trigger a response from Russia. President Biden and British Prime Minister Keir Starmer are due to meet on Friday, where it's understood this topic will feature in their talks. Malcolm Hudson, NTD News, London. And Russia is launching a counteroffensive in its Kursk region. Ukraine, though, says it was prepared for the counteroffensive. And this is all why the U.S. says it intercepted Russian military aircraft over Alaska. Here's the latest update. Russia released this footage on Thursday, saying it shows its troops operating in the Kursk region where Ukraine launched an incursion last month. It also showed troops building a temporary bridge over a river. Ukraine has previously destroyed multiple bridges in the region to cut off Russian troops. Russia now says it has recaptured 10 settlements in the Kursk region. Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky confirmed that Russia launched a counteroffensive saying Ukraine was prepared for it. The Pentagon said this about Russia's counterattack on Thursday. At this stage, I would uh, say that it's, uh, you know, marginal, uh, but something obviously that we're, we're keeping an eye on. Uh, Zelensky uh, renewed calls for Ukraine to be allowed to use long-range capabilities against Russia. That's to strike weapons stored in Russia. Prolonging this process of lifting long-range restrictions leads to the fact that Russia is moving these military targets deeper into Russian territory. Russian President Vladimir Putin on Thursday said Ukraine doesn't have the technology to use long-range weapons without direct help from NATO member countries. This will mean that NATO countries, the United States and European countries are fighting against Russia, and if this is so, then we will make appropriate decisions based on the threats that will be created for us. A reporter asked the Pentagon about media reports, saying the State Department is considering removing the long-range restrictions on Ukraine. I've uh, certainly seen the press reports on that. Uh, I would tell you uh, there has been no change to our policy. I don't have anything to announce. Uh, and certainly, if there are any changes, we'll let you know. But as of today... And Russia was also active near Alaska. The North American Aerospace Defense Command published a tweet saying NORAD detected, tracked, and intercepted two Russian military aircraft operating in Alaska on Wednesday. NORAD fighter jets from the United States conducted the intercept. The statement added that the Russian action is not seen as a threat and that NORAD will continue to monitor competitor activity. And a bipartisan group of lawmakers unveiling new legislation that would strengthen U.S. sanctions on the Venezuelan regime. Our Washington correspondent Luis Martinez has more on the story. The Valor Act, a bipartisan bill presented by Republican Congresswoman Maria Elvira Salazar, would block U.S. foreign assistance to any country providing assistance except humanitarian aid to the Venezuelan regime. In a statement, Congresswoman Salazar made it clear that a message needs to be sent loud and clear that the United States will be doing no more business with the Maduro dictatorship. Now, but that's uh, something that we need to do and the Biden administration needs to do. Instead of rewarding the Maduro regime, we need to start punishing the Maduro regime. And yes, companies that are doing business with the regime, putting money in the pockets of these crooks, need to be sanctioned. Right, just wanting to stand with the Venezuelan community against what's going on in Venezuela with the government. So I'm trying to do that on a bipartisan basis. Congressman Corey Mills argued that it is in the national security interest of the United States to find a solution to the Venezuelan crisis. Our, our greatest threat isn't sitting in Ukraine 9,000 miles away. It's in our own hemisphere. And we're sitting here ignoring it. We need to have a seat at the table. So even if you don't agree with what the Chavez are doing or you don't believe what's happening in Venezuela, you still at least need a, a seat at the table to understand what's happening so that we can actually play a role there. Because if not, the Russia, China, Iran, North Korea geopolitical alignment is going to grow stronger and stronger in our own hemisphere. And then we're gonna, not going to have anything north and south of us to be able to rely upon. The State Department announced 16 new sanctions against the Maduro regime. The Venezuelan regime claimed victory in the July 27th presidential elections. And the State Department has accused the regime of tampering with the results 
falsely claiming victory and widespread repression to maintain power. Opposition presidential candidate Edmundo González is currently in exile in Spain. The Spanish government has recognized González as the president-elect of Venezuela. It is important to note that Representatives Mills, Salazar, Jimenez, and Moskowitz are all congressmen from the state of Florida, where approximately 380,000 Venezuelans live. Yes. Reporting from Washington, D.C., Luis Eduardo Martinez, NTD News. An intra-party friction among Republicans on display as lawmakers left in limbo on how to avert a government shutdown. But the party was united today in passing their final China-related bill, although most Democrats did oppose it. And the D's Melina Weiskup reports. Wrapping up their China week, House lawmakers passed a bill meant to prevent tax dollars from propping up the Chinese regime's EV battery companies. The American people do not want CCP-affiliated companies setting up shop in their towns and neighborhoods. The American people do not want to be held hostage to the whims of the Chinese Communist Party for our supply of critical minerals. Under the current regulations brought about by the Inflation Reduction Act, these nightmares have become our reality. Seven Democrats sided with Republicans, but the majority of Democrats opposed it, arguing it would hurt American innovation and businesses. Ironically, this bill would make it harder for us to compete with China. These new unclear restrictions under this bill would make it completely unworkable and lead the auto industry and battery manufacturers to pull back their U.S. investments. Republicans, however, claim that Biden's tax credits for EVs benefit China, since the country supplies the materials for EV batteries. While Republicans showed unity on this bill, cracks are showing on another. The week ended on a sour note for House Republican leadership, after they were forced to yank a bill from the floor lacking their own party's support. People have concerns about all sorts of things. That's how the process works, and sometimes it takes a little more time. Speaker Johnson started out the week with high hopes of passing a bill to fund the government into March of next year, saddled with a measure to require proof of citizenship to vote. The bill doomed from the start in the Democrat-controlled Senate. This proposal isn't even serious. It's dangerous. Failing to secure that full party support, House Speaker Mike Johnson is now in for a weekend of conducting touchy budget talks. Adding to the mix, former President Trump has weighed in, saying that if Republicans can't secure that voting measure, they should, in his words, in no way, shape, or form pass a short-term government funding bill. Reporting from Washington, D.C., Melina Weiskup, NTD News. And welcome back. If you're just joining us now, here's some of today's top headlines. A 4.7 magnitude earthquake hit Malibu, California today. There were no immediate reports of injuries or significant damage, but the quake happened as the region deals with major wildfires. Francine has weakened into a post-tropical cyclone after making landfall as a Category 2 hurricane in Louisiana. There were no immediate reports of injuries or major damage, but over 300,000 customers remain without power. And the judge overseeing the Georgia election case against former President Trump and others tossed out three counts in the indictment. They include two counts against Trump. The judge said that the counts lie beyond the state's jurisdiction. Trump is campaigning in Tucson, Arizona, while Vice President Kamala Harris rallies in North Carolina. Trump says he won't participate in a future debate with Harris, while Harris says she's open to another round. And joining us now to discuss the debate and the future of the presidential campaign are two guests. Jeff Courier is a political analyst and host of Ringside Politics radio and TV shows. And Bart Marcois is a former presidential campaign advisor and a former U.S. diplomat. Now, gentlemen, thanks so much for coming on. We appreciate it. Bart, straight to you. Are you surprised with the president's and former president's announcement today? No, not in the least. I think that when he looked at the analytics after the debate and uh, 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 as things have been shaking out in the last uh, 24 hours, he realized that he won that debate very handily. He is winning among independents. Independents shifted heavily, more than two to one in his direction after the debate. He removed the fear factor that the Democrats had thrown into it, trying to make him a, a boogeyman Independents watched him and said, if that's as bad as it gets, I can live with that because I really was better off 
when Trump was president than I have been the last three and a half years. Now, Jeff, I want to put it to you with a little bit of a caveat. We heard people like Governor Gavin Newsom in California saying that Harris exceeded all expectations in the debate. Now, we have heard the similar sentiments from both sides of the political spectrum. Is there a chance here that President Trump perhaps thinks that it's just not in his best interest to do another debate? Well, he has done uh, six of these now. I mean, he did uh, three against uh, Hillary. Uh, this, that was his seventh one. He did two against Biden in uh, 2020. And now it's his second one that he's done in this uh, cycle. People know him. I mean, I think there's no need for him to do another one. People know President Trump. They know his record. It's well established. Uh, I do think uh, Kamala Harris did better than expectations because the expectations were so low. If I would have been advising President Trump, I would have said, raise the expectations super high so that, uh, you know, when she uh, performs OK, people aren't going to say, wow, she did great. But uh, the, the moderators were biased. It was a three on one uh, debate. So President Trump's been through this so many times. I don't think he needs to do it again. The person that really needed the debate was Kamala Harris. And she did get help from the moderators. She did get help from the questions. So, of course, she wants another one. And I think it is in President Trump's best interest not to do another one of these debates because she's not going to go on another type of a network that is not considered left wing. Right. Now, Bart, on that point, if there are still undecided voters out there, considering we, we've known President Trump as a politician for, for so many years now, what are the undecided voters? How will they be swayed at this point in the race? I think that the undecided voters are people who say, you know what, I have to admit I was better off when Trump was president, and I have to admit I like his policies. I don't want more of the Biden policies, but they don't really like him. They think he's a little bit icky. They, that, that's something that the Democrats have been pushing, and it's, it's resonated with people. It sticks. And, and what they saw in the debate was that he was actually just fine. Um, and and you, see, you see polls in swing states saying, look, we really don't want to go to war again. And when Barack Obama was in office and when Biden and Harris have been in office, people have started wars around the world and the United States has gotten involved. When Trump was in office, there was no war started and, and the wars that, had, that were going on, the military conflicts that were going on, came to a swift end. That's a big deal for people. Now, Bart, if, I'm not sure if you're on Twitter or not, but the sentiment among Republicans or conservatives there was that Kamala Harris was going to have a terrible debate and she's a terrible uh, candidate, et cetera, et cetera. Now, we have seen not only in the polls, but also in the betting odds that Harris is actually taking a lead over Trump. Is there a, a, a kind of, um, how would I say it, a, a, a complacency among Republicans, even now as we talk about Trump does not need another uh, debate over the strength of that campaign and perhaps the momentum that it is gaining? Uh, I am on Twitter. I'm at B. Marcoy's on Twitter. And, and yes, I've seen that. And the, the, the professional Republicans, they, they, I live in the D.C. area, and the people here thought Trump did a terrible job and Kamala won it. Because, as, as Jeff said, the expectations were so low, we were expecting a knockout punch like uh, Biden got, and that didn't happen. But it still comes back to the fact that we have somebody there who is a champion for us, and he knows he's in a boxing ring. He knows he was there, and it was three on one, and he fought against it. And, and we look at it, and we know that when he says, I'm fighting for you, he means it. He's a billionaire. He does not have to continue fighting. He does it because he believes in what he's doing. Right. He has more power outside politics. If he quit politics, he would go back to being right. popular again. He's mm. doing it for us. Mm. We saw politicians like Mitt Romney show up to a boxing match with a badminton racket. And, you know, he swung his racket at Candy Crowley in the debate and nothing happened. Right. President Trump is there. He's boxing. He's ready. And he's fighting on behalf of us. Right. And I think that as people look at that, they will continue to mm. swing toward him. Mm. Bart, I don't, I wanna, um, 
I want to move on because my time is very limited. I want to toss this question to Jeff as well because I think it's an important question. Jeff, especially with this caveat of um, Taylor Swift has now endorsed Harris right after the debate. Is there a complacency perhaps among Republicans over the strength of the Harris campaign? Well, there shouldn't be. I mean, uh, just look at the uh, last two elections. I mean, they were razor close. I mean, Hillary uh, and, and Biden and the polls show this thing is uh, very, very close. There should be no complacency. And uh, every endorsement that either candidate gets is crucial. Uh, every action that you take from here on in is crucial. I think, I think President Trump is in a little better position than he was in 2016 and 2020 at this time. But he's running against a candidate who, frankly, is better than uh, Joe Biden. And there's more enthusiasm now for the Democrats than they had under Joe Biden. So the Trump campaign needs to take this very, very seriously. But we knew Taylor Swift was going to be endorsing uh, Kamala Harris. So that's no surprise. Those voters were going to go to Kamala Harris anyway. So we do need to see uh, definite urgency on behalf of the Trump campaign. They're focusing on the swing states. That's where the focus needs to be. And I think it is going to be, again, a very, very close election. But I do think President Trump's in better shape this time than he was in uh, 2016 or 2020, really. Bart Mark Hoy is Jeff Courier. Appreciate it. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you. Anthony Sam Wong was out at the National Mall to find out how much celebrity endorsements actually matter to voters. Where do you position yourself uh, politically? Conservatively. Okay. And who are you rooting for? Uh, Trump. Uh, Camilla. I'm a Democrat, lifelong. I'm an independent. Independent. Uh, we're Trump fans. I'm a registered Democrat, but I'll vote, I vote usually Republican. I believe everybody has the right to vote the way they feel. However, for today, I'm going to have to vote for Trump. I would consider myself a Democrat. And now I feel like it's very kind of divided on both sides. Wish I could find more of a middle ground, but lately I haven't been able to. Well, recently, we're seeing uh, Taylor Swift uh, throwing her support behind Kamala Harris. What do you make of that decision? And do celebrity endorsements matter to you? Um, I think they do matter because they have a big platform and they could get like a lot of voters to choose like who they believe is right. I don't care about celebrity endorsements. I don't care about celebrity endorsements means absolutely nothing to me. She has a very big stage and uh, stay out of politics. I mean, goodness. If she got that many likes in such a short amount of time, she should be putting that for something a little bit maybe bigger, you know, support for Palestine, things like that. I don't mind it. I think it'll help. I actually like when people in public eye voice their opinion because they're not scared. They don't matter to me, but I think I'm naive in the fact that they probably make a big difference. Just because you got a lot of people watching them singing, dancing, is that really knowledge of political s system and what's going on in real life? I don't think so. They should stick to what they're doing. And what do you make of uh, uh, Taylor Swift's decision there? Don't care. They're a great decision. We're together. Let's go. Let's go, Taylor. Her opinion wouldn't carry any weight with me. I just think it's a personal opinion. It's who she wants to support, and that's that's great. And welcome back. A group of astronauts made history today. They're the first ever all civilian crew to complete a spacewalk, leaving their ship with only their spacesuits to protect them. Here's the historic footage. Our commander Jared Isaacman now turning. The crank. Four astronauts made history today. They are the first all civilian team to enter the vacuum of space. It was part of SpaceX's Polaris Dawn mission. Billionaire Jared Isaacman, who funded the mission, was the first to ascend. This helmet cam, what we, that structure we see is the, the spacewalker. Leading to this historic view. <laughs> One reason for the spacewalk was to test the spacesuits. SpaceX will use the tests to improve the suits and possibly use them for future missions on Mars. Out in space, the only protection astronauts have is their suits. 
oxygen is pumped into the entire outfit. This creates a complete life support system. This gives them the ability to breathe and creates a pressurized environment that protects their bodies. All the oxygen has to be pumped out of the entire ship because there's no airlock. So every astronaut needs air in their suits, even if they're not going out. After testing out the suit, Isaacman returned to the ship. SpaceX engineer Sarah Gillis was the second and last to enter space. The five-day Polaris Dawn mission is expected to end on Sunday, September 15th. Its goal is to prepare for the human colonization of Mars. Incredible, really. And rock star John Bon Jovi made headlines for saving a woman's life. Police say he persuaded a Tennessee woman not to jump from a bridge. The incident was caught on surveillance camera. You can see John Bon Jovi and another person speaking to the woman before helping her climb back to safety. Nashville's police chief says the musician was in the middle of a photo shoot on a pedestrian bridge Tuesday when he noticed the woman standing on the ledge. After lifting the woman to safety, the two shared a hug. Bon Jovi and his team then walked her off the bridge to safety. Amazing. And now for your sports news, we're joined by NTD's Dave Martin. Dave, how's it going? It's going well, Paul. Good to have you here. Thank you. Dave, plenty going on today. Want to start in college football. We have the Pac-12 adding four new schools. That'll start in 2026, I believe. All right. That will bring their total to six. They want eight from what I believe. Do you see them adding more and, and who might it be? Yeah, I do. I mean, basically, the NCAA has given this league, which is down to two members now, really, they're probably, you say, the weakest two, a two year grace period to get up to the man mandated number of eight schools to qualify as a conference. So they added Boise State, Colorado State, Fresno State, and San Diego State, basically the most desirable schools from the Mountain West Conference. Although I would have thought UNLV would have been included as well. I'm not sure why they were left out. But I would think they would have the kind of their choice of the remaining schools that aren't already in a power conference. And they're at least west of the Mississippi River. Now these decisions, they're normally based on, you know, what will what teams will help them get the most lucrative TV deal. So a good football school near a metropolitan area, I think is a good, good bet. Now I think they'll be looking at some Texas schools. I'm thinking North Texas, maybe Rice, something like that. But it looks like that decision is now going to be made with six members instead of two. Well, keep us up to date, see if they get to the eight. Now, I want to go quickly to the World Doping Agency. It released a report today. You can fill us in. The, the report essentially gave them a pass for their handling of the 23 Chinese swimmers who stayed eligible. That was despite testing for, a, for positive substances, enhancing drugs. They did note some irregularities. Can you just expand on those for us? Yeah, the World Anti-Doping Agency there. You know, for one thing, the athletes didn't, themselves didn't have to defend their innocence. It was the Chinese authorities who did their talking for them. Now, it's not only unusual, it's actually against the rules. That's what the report said. There was also the case of what the anti, World Anti-Doping Agency's own chief scientist had doubts over, and that is how a few micrograms of this drug found in the kitchen of the hotel where the swimmer stayed at was enough to cause entire group contamination. Where's 23 swimmers we're talking about? Uh, obviously, that's a big one to me. But essentially, because he couldn't discount that scenario with solid evidence, he felt he had no other option than to take them at their word. That's the word of the Chinese authorities we're talking about. Now, there were also, also several other items in this 56-page report that showed that protocols were not followed. Those generally concluded that they were not followed for um, expediency's sake instead of favoritism. Now, Travis Tigart of the U.S. Anti-Doping Agency was not very pleased uh, with this report, so it sounds like the U.S. Uh, is hoping there's going to be more to come out about this, or they're going to launch their own investigation, possibly. A microdose in a kitchen, that's one. Keep us up to date on that as well. Now, NFL, Thursday Night Football, we have Buffalo, Miami. How is Josh Allen? He's good to go. I was a little surprised at this. You might, I mean, this is a hand thing. Is he, he hurt his hand in Sunday's game. He did come in afterwards. Of course, afterwards, everyone's going to be worried about that because the quarterback, you have to use your hand. Thankfully for him, it was to his throw. It was to his non-throwing hand. He did come back in the game. He wasn't even listed on their injury report today. Uh, now that, but now that's huge for Buffalo. They've won four straight division titles. They've got a revamped team this year, but he has been the key to them winning in the past. Now, meanwhile, the Dolphins, you know, they've got that very creative, very speedy offense, very difficult to stop. I think tonight is going to be more important for the Dolphins to win. They have been an up-and-coming team. Technically, these two tied with the division lead last year. Buffalo won the tiebreaker, though, because they swept the season series. So, you know, you, if you want to become a contender, you've got to take down the top dog. Buffalo is that it. 
Uh, so in any case, tonight, this game is going to be at 8.15 Eastern Time. Great to see football back again. It is, isn't it? Hey, Dave, thank you. We appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thank you, Paul. That's all for today's news. Thanks for joining us. And for round-the-clock coverage, you can visit us at ntd.com or download our NTD app. It's great. Thanks for tuning in. I'm Paul Graney. Tiffany Meyer will be back tomorrow. Don't worry. Good night.